What do we lose if the space launch system gets canceled? Are nuclear rockets a game changer for space travel? And do we even know how to die in space? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Drew D, do you think we lose any ability by canceling the SLS? That's a, that's a great question because it's actually really tough. So so instead, like, I'm just going to wander in this area for a little bit and then maybe I will come to a conclusion. So like the Space Launch System currently is the largest operational human rated spacecraft that is capable of sending missions out into deep space. It has the Orion capsule. It's capable of sending a crew of astronauts to around the moon and returning them safely back to Earth. Um, and it was built for tens of billions of dollars. And it appears that every single launch, it's going to cost, uh, you know, four plus billion dollars, which on the face of it is pretty unsustainable as a, as a rocket launch platform. But giving the United States the ability to launch heavy payloads is is a thing that has been needed for a long time that a lot of missions have been put on the back burner just because there's just no heavy lift capacity to be able to handle them uh, in terms of human space exploration, but even missions to Neptune and, and things like that. And so if you want to do those kinds of missions, which is the kind of thing that large nations want to be able to do, then you need to be able to build and develop the hardware to do this. You know, China is sprinting full speed to try to develop that capability. They've got a new version of the Long March rocket that they're working on, the one that will be capable of delivering sort of similar capacity to the moon, not quite as powerful, but it should be able to deliver a crew of astronauts to lunar orbit from Earth in one launch. And then they're going to also send the landing craft in a second launch. And that's kind of like what NASA is doing. And so you know, if NASA doesn't build this thing and operate it and continue going to the moon, then you can argue that they're kind of giving up their ability to be able to go to the moon. Now, obviously, you have to sort of consider this under the shadow of Starship, which is a completely new, independently developed, privately built spacecraft system. And in fact, Starship is going to be part of the Artemis mission to the moon. It's going to provide the lander. And so you're in this situation, but you know, Starship isn't necessarily human rated today, maybe it'll be human rated down the road, and it hasn't been proven to do what it's supposed to do, be able to land the booster, land the the actual crew capsule or the top part back on Earth safely and be able to reuse them. That hasn't been done yet. But you kind of does it doesn't matter, right? Because even in expendable mode, this thing is valuable, like you could just throw away starships, and it would still be cheaper than throwing away uh, SLS and would have value. But there's this issue that you, ha you have to refuel starship in space because it's such a large lander, but uh, you know, maybe there's another way to produce other landers. So it's this very weird, complicated, uncomfortable time where you've got this workforce of tens of 1000s of people who used to be working on the space shuttle and they transitioned over to be working on the space launch system. And this is an enormous amount of just like raw brain power, people who have tremendous experience in working on rockets on payloads on deep space exploration. And that if you then just shut it all down, and just let them all go right, then you are just releasing all of this expertise that was once held by NASA and its various aerospace contractors just back into the wild. And some of them are going to end up at places like SpaceX, others are going to end up at other rocket firms, others are just going to go get a different job. So I think there's a downside to that. And obviously, there's going to be a lot of unemployment across all of these things. But then it's not the government's job to, to provide this kind of um, unemployment insurance of like, yeah, we'll make you work on rockets forever until you know, you die. So, um, so I think that in my perfect world, there would be a smaller, rational, more rational, more reasonable, more specific attempt to reach the moon that you would use something like say Falcon Heavy, with a 
crew dragon that you would send to say two falcon heavies to the moon one that has the lander that's custom built for landing on the moon one that has an orion capsule or maybe a scale down orion capsule and then they meet up and exactly what the chinese are doing and then if starship is able to perform that activity and it's able to pr perform it on a regular basis then it makes sense to start shifting some you know money over to that and so i don't think that there's any scenario that the space launch system is the right solution for the future of space exploration, that you can accomplish the same things that SLS can do for less money, if you just take a more targeted approach. So the United States, our neighbor loses um, in the short term by just losing its capacity and putting all its hopes and dreams in a private company. Uh, but over the long term, there's just no way that SLS could have been maintained and survived. And so if it's, if it's done, it's best done quickly. And that is to cancel it. Lamar Reyes, what are your thoughts on a space dry dock? Do you see drones out there or actual people like both dock and ships? So I mean, I recently just did an interview about the idea of a space dock, a dr space dry dock. And I think there's a lot of advantages, but obviously, we are not there technologically that you require a certain amount of infrastructure out in space before you can um, like actually <laughs> be be manufacturing large spacecraft in space. And the idea I think is really solid because like right now, when you try to build any kind of spacecraft, any kind of large vehicle, then you've got to somehow get it inside a rocket fairing. And the biggest rocket fairing that exists right now, they're five meters in theory, Starship is gonna have a nine meter rocket fairing, it's 18 meters long, like that's, that's a pretty significant amount, you can imagine, you know, swapping, you know, Starship itself is a fairly large spacecraft that you can do to to fly around. But you have to build this thing so that it can handle Earth gravity, which is totally different from the weightlessness that you experience out in space. And then it has to be able to handle the vibration and the noise and the, all of the forces that happen from the launch and the pressure changes, and then you're out in space. And then you can actually it's being in the environment that it was supposed to be in. And so if you can go and you can actually just build your spacecraft in the environment that it was meant to be in in the first place, without ever having to deal with Earth gravity with Earth pressure, with temperature changes with with uh, vibrations and so on, then you are able to make with more lightweight material, you're able to make things with um, sort of right for the job. But then you bring in the complexity of trying to assemble something being able to bring things together in space, bring all the hardware up there and actually assembling these things. So you make a spacecraft that's more right for the task at hand, but you're adding all the complexity of assembly and manufacturing all this stuff out into space. But it feels like that's the inevitable path. Like as we build more infrastructure into our ability to explore space, then we will these kinds of things will start to become more and more obvious, like maybe we'll launch a satellite, and it'll be just kind of the core hub, the intelligence parts, and then it'll meet up at the space dock. And then the space dock will provide various 3d printed and assembled struts and hubs and radar dishes and things that can be done in space in the beginning. And over time, more and more complexity will be launched and assembled in space. But it really feels like, you know, space assembly is the first thing that we're going to figure out. And then like actual space manufacturing where we are building stuff out of their raw material to make something. So yeah, I think it's the inevitable future. And now it's just a matter of us figuring out all the ways to accomplish it at whatever time frame makes the most sense. If you want to support the work we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. Your support lets us have a minimum of ads and no sponsorship messages. Patrons get no ads on universetoday.com for life. Want the extra parts of the live stream that aren't in this edited version? You can sign up for a special patron-only podcast feed and get the overtime segments, as well as other special behind-the-scenes episodes, including our monthly patron-only question show. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers. Michael McChesney, Sander, Rhonda Garcia, Mark Eister, David Brook, and Dominic Rotker. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Benjamin Hunky. People are dreaming of becoming an interplanetary species, but from an ethical viewpoint, do we even know how to die in space? Does anyone have a plan for burials on Mars? 
Like, do we know how to die in space? I mean, that's the default is going to space is space is trying to kill you. And uh, really, death is the inevitable outcome for almost any action that you attempt to take. So we sure know how to die in space, or we will, you know, even though we haven't done it yet, we'll figure it out real quick. Does anyone have a plan for burials on Mars? Uh, not that I've heard of. And I can't imagine that anybody would be willing to give up the value of a human body uh, in terms of, of raw material that when you think about the all of the organic material, the biome, the best thing to do is to compost bodies on Mars in the same way that we're going to compost everything else and have those re enter the food stream. That feels like like to actually go and take a body and dig into the regolith and and bury somebody seems like it will be a waste of of nutrients. You know, and I think for a lot of people, they consider that sort of horrifying. But you know, I really like the idea of of being buried under a tree, for example, when you die, and then and then the tree grows based on your nutrients and does really well. And that's sort of much better than than filling up graveyards with with people. So, uh, you know, maybe I'm a little more of a, a environmentalist on that perspective. Paul Wilson, space is amazing, but you work with it every day. And when was the last time something blew your mind that you found out regarding space? My mind gets blown every day. I mentioned the stat earlier on in the chat that there are between tens of trillions and hundreds of trillions of objects in the Oort cloud. And this is like I'm reading a planetary science book right now. And it casually mentioned this fact. And I'm just like, wait, what? Hundreds of trillions of objects bigger than one kilometer in the Oort cloud. That's crazy. So that was so and that happened yesterday morning. So that's the most recent time that my mind was blown. Uh, but but just reading this opening chapter of this planetary science book gave me a bunch of other stuff. The fact that you know, the sun is 99.8% the mass of the solar system that Jupiter's mass accounts for twice as much as the rest of the solar system combined. So yeah, this happens all the time, daily, almost. And like I said, like it feels like it's a, a natural consequence of just you're, you're so familiar with so much of the material that now new stuff comes at you. And you're like, what? That's surprising. I love it. But I am a uh, agent of chaos. I enjoy change. I enjoy things changing quickly, rapidly all the time. Uh, you know, on the one hand, as I'm watching the advance of technology, I'm kind of exhausted by it that trying to keep up with it, because part of me is so entertained by it. And uh, I need to stay on top of it all. So yeah, goose, would a spaceship with a nuclear engine go faster than the engines we use currently? Potentially, for sure. Um, so like with rockets, you are limited by the exhaust velocity of the rocket, essentially, the faster you can kick material out of the back of your spacecraft, the faster your spacecraft receives a kick in return, you know, Newton for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The way a rocket works is that you are throwing stuff out the back as fast as you can. And then you get this kick in the opposite direction that moves your rocket faster. With a chemical rocket, the velocity is limited. I forget the number. It's like 4,500 meters per second, but I forget the exact number. But with chemical rockets, you're limited by the exhaust velocity. And then with, say, ion engines, you get a much higher exhaust velocity. You know, it is tens to hundreds of kilometers a second, but you're only able to release a small amount of this material at a time. So it's very efficient. So the trick with a nuclear rocket is that you have the ability to heat up a propellant and blow it out the back of the rocket with a much higher velocity. And so if you launch a nuclear reactor into space, and then you give it some kind of propellant like hydrogen gas, you can achieve a much higher, it's called specific impulse. And so that will allow the rocket to make higher amounts of change of its velocity compared to a chemical rocket. And it all depends on how much fuel that you maintain on board. But if you can maintain a large amount of fuel, then you can fire that for a long period of time. And so it's proposed that you can knock down the flight time, say to Mars, like right now, the fastest flight we do to Mars is nine months, nine to 12 months. And in theory, you could knock that flight down to three to six months using a nuclear rocket. And so that what lets you get to Mars very quickly could also let you get to other parts in the solar system 
very rapidly as well. And in fact, there are practical tests for nuclear reactors in space coming. NASA has done a contract to test one out in the next couple of years. The Chinese are probably working on space based nuclear engines. Uh, the Soviets launched like 30 fission reactors into space. Um, and have tested out that technology, they haven't used them as rockets, but nuclear rockets have been tested out here on Earth. And they just like they absolutely demonstrate all of the capabilities. So it's just a matter of time before someone starts launching nuclear rockets into space. We've got a longer version of this question show over on Patreon with one additional bonus question. And if you want to watch that, there's a link in the show notes, so you can check it out. All right, those were all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everybody who asked your questions in the YouTube comments and everybody who joined me for the live show. Remember our live show is two hours long. We record it every Monday at 5pm somewhere in the world. So you definitely want to click on the notifications bell to find out when the next one is going to be happening. Now I'm going to talk about the games I've played the most. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Barry Lake Griffin, David Gilton and David Matz, Dustin Cable, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Michael Purcell, Paul Robach, Sean Sargent, Spiderswap.io, Stephen Fowler Munley, Thomas Elskadron, and Vlad Shiblin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. All right, I was wondering like how many games I've played and how much time I've spent on those games. And so I went foolishly and looked for the games on Steam that I have spent the most time on. And so if you go to your profile, click on games in the sidebar, and then click on all your games and then go to, and you can sort it by playtime that tells you the games you've spent the most time on. And so here is my top five list. Number five is Europa Universalis at 308 hours. And this is like a historical simulation of politics and war in Europe and eventually the entire world leading from the 1200s until the late 1800s. And it's a just a great game. Uh, takes a long time to play each round, but I really enjoy all the dynamics of the game. And number four is Don't Starve at 333 hours. And this is just like such a great uh, survival game with crafting, but also some action, but the action isn't that complicated. Uh, it's a it's a really great game. And, and I love the kind of whimsical style and design that this is done. Number four is Battle Brothers at 490 hours. This is a mercenary game turn based where you lead a crew of mercenaries and you gear them up, you go get through battles, you buy them various upgrades and weapons and armor and try to become a successful mercenary company. And number four is Project Zomboid at 841 hours. Like this is almost my perfect game where you're a survivor after the zombie apocalypse. And it is just brutally realistic where you are breaking into cars, breaking into houses, trying to find food, trying to craft things to be able to survive longer. And every game always ends in your death. In fact, before you start the game, they tell you this is how you died. And so I played Project Zomboid for so much time and I really enjoy it. And they just released the new Build 42. And so now I'm back in. And the number one game is RimWorld at 1187 hours. And RimWorld is the perfect game, which is like if you've never played RimWorld, then you need to play RimWorld. But if you play RimWorld, then you know what I'm talking about. It is just this amazing colony simulator where it gets right down to the nitty gritty detail about how various people feel about other people, all of the wounds they've taken, all of their concerns, they freak out and can uh, go into eating binges. And yet at the same time, there are raiders trying to attack your colony, you're trying to make it more defensible. And at the same time, tell an interesting story with all of the people in your game. And there's a bonus game that I don't even know how much time I've spent in it, but it's a lot. And that is Path of Exile 1. I typically throw in 50 to 100 hours for every season of Path of Exile, try to get to the end ish game. And then they reset the season every three months. And so I've I'm sure I've spent more time in Path of Exile than I have on RimWorld. So go ahead and put your top five games into the comments down below. And if you don't like don't have access to Steam, or you don't know, just give me a list of what are your favorite favorite games. All right, we'll see you next time.